What a dump. Hey, where's that from? I know, because it's the classic film lover's guide. Wishing you all happy days, and here we go with another top 10 favorite, and from what I believe, are the best performances by some of the greatest actresses in cinema. Correcto mundo. I am starting from 10 and then climbing up to that number one spot, and rest assured, ladies and gents, I have seen every film of these artists that is for sure keyword attainable, so all these lists come from sincere and phantasmical accuracy. Once again, I only cover artists that have passed on, so anyone who is still alive and kicking will have to keep on working, because their next performance, I believe, could be their very best. I mean, sure? I mean, was this one ever good to begin with? Let's debate this, please. <laughs> but today, I am excited to talk about one of the biggest names in all of cinema and pop culture. Elizabeth Taylor. Dame Elizabeth was born in London, but her American parents moved her to L.A. when she was about nine years old. They thought about moving back, but indeed World War II took over any of those plans. Her mom kept believing her little daughter Elizabeth was meant for Hollywood, so off they went. But for a while, the studios didn't believe Elizabeth as a profitable child star. But with the help of columnist Hedda Hopper, uh, the studios decided to take a chance and she took Universal Pictures' contract. That was cancelled after only a year because they said something to this effect. She didn't have childlike eyes. Her eyes are like an older actress, very mature and wondrous, and she just doesn't have the face of a child. Does that make sense to anyone out there? But good things happen to truly good people at heart in the long run, I say. And her career took off by the time she was six years old. She has a long period of great films, I must say. And yes, she's had some turkeys. Who doesn't in this business? But her personality truly shines through most of her work in the most positive as well as sometimes negative. Yes, among her biggest challenges were the loves of her life. She has been married a total of seven times. Well, eight if you count the remarriage to Richard Burton. Their marriage specifically is something legendary. There have been a number of films done on their relationship alone, including the ridiculously horrendous piece of dreck, Liz and Dick, starring Lindsay Lohan as Liz. God, it's awful. But the BBC film, Burton and Taylor, starring Helena Bonham Carter and Dominic West, is actually quite good. Carter really does capture the essence of Taylor, the movie star, who you love and just can't stand at the same time. However, the two-part miniseries called Liz, the Elizabeth Taylor story, starring Sherilyn Lynn Fenn, is just laughably awful. Someone has to make a great film about her one day. One day, I believe it. She was quite controversial for her whole life. But she's done more positive and impactful things in her life that really make her a star to idolize. You read any magazine, an honorable film preservation board of top 100 movie stars of all time, she without question is on all of those lists. Let it rip, ladies and gentlemen. Here are the top 10 best performances of the beautiful Elizabeth Taylor. Starting off at number 10, The Last Time I Saw Paris. Surprised, anybody? Give this film another chance. Uh, this is quite an underrated picture, starring Van Johnson as a writer who returns to Paris to reminisce on the beautiful life he led until he let it crumble on top of the unfortunate events surrounding his wife, played by Liz Taylor. Their whole love story is beautifully done, and with Liz being only 21 years old here, she owns the actions of Helen. This film is also a loosely based adaptation on F. Scott Fitzgerald's short story, Babylon Revisited. And of course, the studios didn't want the public thinking this was going to be quite a religious experience. <laughs> but this is a film that truly accentuates Liz Taylor's power of carrying a film. It will truly break your heart. Number nine, Giant. One of the best epics ever made, directed by Oscar-winning legend George Stevens. This Oscar-winning classic features the small love story between Leslie and Bick, 
Big is a famous cattle rancher in Texas, and he is immediately smitten with Leslie. And it's amazing how attracted she is to his ambition and confidence. She makes her way to his ginormous ranch after they marry, and she learns the ropes, becoming such a threatening force to her new sister-in-law, unwillingly, played brilliantly by Mercedes McCambridge, I must say. This again is a big character piece. Liz Taylor is gorgeous as ever here, or as Jet says, you sure are pretty, man. But she also has some guts. When it comes to the modern Texas times in act two, the makeup they use on her is really not that bad. She makes the character of Leslie have more charm and guts than what's really expected. I have not read the novel, but I am sure she has done amazing justice to this character. Number eight, The Taming of the True. Franco Zeffirelli's classic adaptation of one of Shakespeare's best romantic comedies. This was the fifth film Elizabeth and Richard did together. And no, I don't want to call them Liz and Dick because it just doesn't sound right in my mouth. Fox was unsure if they wanted to have Elizabeth and Richard in the lead roles because of the financial disaster of Cleopatra. However, with the win of a previous Burton and Taylor film the year before, the studios felt pretty confident. Elizabeth was so timid and scared to play Katerina because she never spoke Shakespeare a day in her life. But damn it, she worked hard and obviously it helped to have Shakespearean legend Richard by her side. And in the end, she is absolutely fantastic as Katerina, owning the screen with fury, white-knuckling all her might on Petruchio. It's adaptations like this that honestly make you hopeful for great Shakespeare film adaptations. And it's more than just Zeffirelli's touch. It's the star power of both Burton and especially Taylor's British Academy Award nominated performances. Number seven, A Place in the Sun. If this doesn't scream poetic romance, I don't know what does. This is one of the greatest American films ever made, period. And yes, brilliantly helmed by George Stevens, but much more so powered by the three lead performances of Monty Clift, Shelley Winters, and yes, of course, Elizabeth Taylor. This remake of the failed film version, An American Tragedy, was something Elizabeth Taylor would be forever grateful for in her career. She has often said it was the most challenging role because this was basically her biggest role at this time. She has said she only worked with dogs and horses until this picture, and here she was starring alongside stage legend Monty Clift. Overwhelmed she was, but because of Monty, her confidence soared, and they had such dynamic chemistry that just explodes off the screen. It's really not that easy or boring to be a romantic lead. What helps is when you have amazing writing, conflict, and character traits to work with. And Elizabeth truly had a role of a lifetime. She plays Angela with such truth and elegance that, in my opinion, this was the performance that made her a star. She also had an amazing fainting moment, which many called the best fainting scene they've seen in Hollywood. Interesting category to hold that in. But once again, I can never get the beautiful, hot, and sensual moment between she and Monty Clift. It tugs on my melodramatic heartstrings every time. Number six, Cleopatra. Yes, the infamous film which began the Taylor and Burton affair back in 1963. Taylor was riding high on her recent Oscar win and her fourth marriage with Eddie Fisher. And supposedly in Hollywood fashion, she accepted the role of Cleopatra over a joking comment for a million dollars. Uh... Hollywood didn't exactly question too much, did they? Since by the time the film was shooting, put on hold, continued, and reshot, done, and in distribution, with all that, Elizabeth made about $7 million. A record, no doubt. With her illness still on the rise, they had to move the shoot to Rome versus London, where of course she had a ball, especially getting to know Richard, whom they still had a love-hate relationship. Now, people still crap on this movie. And yeah, I know, it's, it's a huge mess. But with all of its issues, before it was cut to death from its original runtime of six hours, 
there is still, sincerely, a breathtaking performance by Elizabeth Taylor. She is still utterly fantastic in the role. Honestly, she was born to play. Cleopatra, the seductive ruler who wants to own both Egypt and Rome, with 64 costume changes, no less. Richard apparently has said that he praised Elizabeth's performance, saying that he was acting Mark Antony, and she just is Cleopatra. When you look at her personal life, for sure, for sure, it's definitely quite relevant and quite visible there. But there was something so captivating about just how Elizabeth Taylor stared at you, how she just glared. Her stance, her body language said so much more than what the constant rewrites could tell her. Very, very well done. Number five, National Velvet. This is such a tender and beautiful film. And was Elizabeth Taylor's big break being her huge, ginormous starring role. Based on the book by Enid Bagnold, it's the sweet story of my Taylor, played by Mickey Rooney, who comes to England for business, stumbles upon Pie, a horse with potential, and the lovely Velvet Brown wants everything in the world to ride him in the grand national race. You can absolutely say this is a sports film, and a damn good one it is. It's one of the best horse racing films ever made, and the performances elevate this film to just to being a masterful film for both adults and kids. Especially when you look at a 12-year-old Elizabeth Taylor here. She was actually rejected by the studios for this part, saying she was too boyish. So she doubled up on her protein and meals, trained in horse riding for three months, and by that time, she grew three inches and natural curves to give her more of a female body that the studio felt she was right for. Interesting how men thought that way, huh? Man, she earned this role well. And it's one of those things where the role just feels so right with her in it. Elizabeth's tenderness to Velvet and to Pie, whose real name was King Charles, adorable, right? Is what brings us so much closer to their relationship and hope for their triumph. Awesomely enough, by the end of filming, she was able to keep King Charles until his death in 1956. If you have yet to see National Velvet, do you and your kids, if you have them, a favor and enjoy this inspirational and cuddly film on a Sunday morning. You'll absolutely love it. Number four, Raintree County. A very important film in Elizabeth Taylor's filmography, which was her first Academy Award nomination for Best Actress in 1957. This was very much a well-deserved nod as well, as she plays a Southern belle who falls in love with a young, idealistic graduate played by Monty Clift. And their marriage together exposes many, many secrets and unspoken beliefs in politics during the backdrop of the Civil War. Once again, this film is basically a knockoff of Gone with the Wind with its themes. But unlike that film, Raintree County was a flop. And at that time, the most expensive film film they produced at five million dollars which in 2022 inflation that's over 52 million seven hundred eighteen thousand one hundred forty nine dollars cry monotly as far as a film goes there are some tedious moments for sure but elizabeth taylor without a doubt shines beautifully in this film it's not another recreation of scarlett o'hara i assure you elizabeth taylor certainly makes it her own and relishes in the ignorance of new politics and stays strong in fighting for what she wants and, and what she feels is right. And once again, the chemistry between her and Monty is just so dynamic and so beautiful that you can tell these two would be another power couple in film. This was the film where Monty got into his nearly fatal car accident where Elizabeth ran to the crash site, climbed into Monty's car, and pulled out his teeth from his throat, which were choking him. She comforted him until the paramedics arrived, and I can only imagine what that must have been like. The studios, of course, tried to take out their insurance of getting another actor to replace him, but Elizabeth Taylor fought for him and fought for him and fought for him. What an amazing friend she really was. It's bravery on and off screen like that that just always kind of surprised me 
of how much of an amazing human being Elizabeth Taylor was. Her performance here is certainly one to cherish, and I would say you can find it on certain websites on DVD. So if you get the chance, definitely take advantage of it. Number three, Suddenly Last Summer. A somewhat of a cult classic, if I do say so myself, with Taylor in her third Academy Award nominated performance for Best Actress. Alongside fellow nominee Katherine Hepburn and her dear friend Monty Clift. This is the third time I've mentioned this film on this channel, and it's kind of wild since the film itself is not necessarily terrific. But what is terrific about it, and what gives it such merit, are indeed the performances. Elizabeth is wildly commanding and electric as Catherine, niece of Violet, who is the subject of getting lobotomized by Dr. John over a horrible event she witnessed on her cousin Sebastian. Without spoiling anything, it ends in grandiose, operatic grandeur. Something Tennessee Williams is very notable and epic for. And damn, those last 20 minutes are just amazing. Elizabeth Taylor, oh man, she really blew open the doors with her power in this film. You might say the agitating direction under Joseph Mankiewicz might have fueled it, since she was fighting for her dear friend and co-star, Monty to stay in the film because the studio and Mankiewicz were looking to fire him over his drug intake due to his accident he had two years prior. But she still kept on fighting and kept on fighting for him and I say he still gives all that he can in this. Taylor and Hepburn really do own this picture and even though Taylor had not done any Shakespeare at this point, she still mastered the modern Shakespeare Tennessee Williams here. Number two, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Holy cow, one of the greater film adaptations of a classic play I've ever seen, starring Paul Newman as Brick and Taylor as Maggie the Cat, Brick's neglected and love-hungry wife. Okay, okay, ladies and gents, okay. Yes, it completely waters down Tennessee Williams' gutsy and soulful Pulitzer Prize-winning masterpiece. Yes, it does, including taking out the homosexual subtext. But, side note, Paul Newman still plays that beautifully. We can all see it. And as far as a film like this to come out through the production code, with language and themes Tennessee Williams talks about, it still is a thrilling production. Many, many thanks again to the performances. Elizabeth contracted a virus before filming began, so it had to be put on hold. But then it was coming back on, and her husband, Mike Todd, at the time had to take a flight. And he was unfortunately killed in the plane crash. This obviously devastated Elizabeth, but she pressed on to the beginning of filming and showed the most professionalism, I think, in her whole career in film. Every move she has as Maggie is so damn captivating and utterly sexy. She and Paul Newman together are just another match that explodes off the screen. You know one of the classic phrases from a film that just pops in your head randomly is when she screams out, Maggie the cat is alive! I'm alive! I don't know what, it's just the reading of it that has been cemented in my head for years and years. Thanks to the essence and power of Taylor. For her work here, again, she was nominated for her second Academy Award for Best Actress here, and my goodness, wholeheartedly deserved. Now, here are some honorable mentions. Secret Ceremony, which, holy cow again, <laughs> this is really a special one, because in all of Elizabeth Taylor's career, she has made some critically amazing films and some critically horrible films. But there are some horrible films that are just so wild and so bad that they are quite entertaining and fun. Like Boom! And X, Y, and Z. <laughs> but I think the film Secret Ceremony is on the very top of that list of films that are so bad, they're good. Elizabeth Taylor just gives a brave and effective performance in a film that definitely is uh, quite of a snuff film with an extra flair of zest involving quite a, a sexual relationship between a mother and a daughter. Remember that hot tub scene between she and Mia Farrow? Oh boy. And a whole 30 second scene of just Elizabeth Taylor 
devouring a steak. No score, no dialogue, just her gobbling down a steak and then giving a nice little belch. I've never seen such a thing out of Elizabeth Taylor at this point. And it just showed a quote-unquote model of a movie star like Taylor just being human. <laughs> it's weird, but in my opinion, it is significant. Secret Ceremony. If you could find it on VHS, please catch it if you're looking for a wild ride in Elizabeth Taylor's filmography. Reflections and a Golden Eye. Another wild-eyed film that honestly has some deep and beautiful performances. Based on the book by Carson McCullers, it tells the story of six characters in search of how they can truly live their best and honest life, dealing with repressed hetero and homosexuality. Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor are a married couple combating those very issues with murderous results. Taylor is absolutely incredible in this, considering how damn weird it is. What were you on, John Huston? And this film was infamous for showing slightly more nude images of Elizabeth Taylor, with that classic stripping and then slowly seductive walk up the stairs. Which again, is very, very brave. Ash Wednesday, a melodrama where Elizabeth plays a 55-year-old woman who goes into cosmetic surgery after a bad car accident, and it opens her life up to a different world of desire and acceptance. Elizabeth Taylor earned a Golden Globe nomination for her performance here, and that's honestly the only positive thing about this film, I have to say. It's just too melodramatic and quite insulting, honestly, given the subject matter of life being better after cosmetic surgery. But it's Elizabeth that shines more through this that makes it valuable. And sure, yes, it has a nice message wrapping it up, saying that life is not better after cosmetic surgery. But like I said, Elizabeth Taylor's performance utterly beautiful. Father of the Bride, the beautiful film adaptation of the book. Did you know that? That's fun. Starring Spencer Tracy and Joan Bennett as respectful parents of Elizabeth Taylor, a young teen just excited to get married to her one true love she met on vacation. This really is such a lovely film, and call me old-fashioned, I still enjoy the hell out of this film. Elizabeth is just wonderful in this as the young, flighty, and emotional bride to be and to give such grace to a role while playing alongside Spencer Tracy. It's just a wonderful and fun film to have in your career. Be you Butterfield 8, or Butterfield 8. Yeah, you, you get the deal. Yeah, were you wondering if I was going to mention this overrated TV movie of the week? It's, it's wild, isn't it? Considering this performance was Elizabeth Taylor's first Academy Award winning performance for Best Actress in 1961. Make no mistake, Elizabeth does well. But even she admitted this is not one of her best performances by a long shot, and that she reportedly hated this film. If you don't know the classic story, it goes like this. She was given the Oscar for her performance because of her serious and fatal illness, and how she pulled through. Even though she did undergo a lot of bad press considering her a homewrecker. What, falling in love with Eddie Fisher, a friend of Mike Todd, her previous husband, and husband to Debbie Reynolds. But yes, she does have some good moments in this film, even if the quality of it is not the level of an A-list. It still has such a strong mark in classic cinema. Number one, of course, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Oh, the film and performance that keeps on inspiring and blowing the minds of artists alike. Without a doubt, everyone has to agree that her performance as Martha in Edward Albee's classic play adaptation is amazingly inspired and epic. Elizabeth Taylor just once again explodes the screen with her visceral rage, her drunken charm, her sick sense of humor, and devastating desperation. This was the fourth collaboration between Taylor and Burton, and man, oh man, is it ever the best. Elizabeth would go on record and say her performance as Martha was personally her favorite. From the very beginning, we see the playful and wild side of Martha as they return home at a godly time, and they will have guests come at 2.30 in the frickin' morning. The whole interplay between George and Martha turns from humorous, joyful, to uncomfortable, heart-pounding, and just shocking. 
It's the cocktail party from hell when Nick and Honey show up and, oh God, do we enjoy every minute of it. As unbelievably uncomfortable as it is. Elizabeth really dove in deep for this role, being 33 years old at the time, playing a 52-year-old. She gained 30 pounds and gave a little makeup and presto, she really transformed into Martha. It's very true that a lead star is only as good as their scene partner, and the whole cast is phenomenal. But of course, God, Richard Burton, everything he feeds her just gives these incredible actions from Taylor. Taylor was so widely praised, deservedly, and was a clear shoo-in for the Academy Award for Best Actress, which she ultimately won. This film continues to inspire many projects and many artists alike, myself included, of course, and thank God Mike Nichols took the chance in casting Taylor and Burton to give us two of the greatest film performances in cinema history. Elizabeth Taylor really is such a classic movie star, a star that was so well respected and also very well loved by the public. Much more than an amazing actress, she was very well known and adored for her humanitarian work. In 1984, she began to offer her services on AIDS awareness due to the unfortunate death to her dear friend, Rock Hudson. And in 1991, she founded the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, which focused on the direct services of people suffering with AIDS, along with the Elizabeth Taylor Medical Center, where people could get free AIDS testing. She earned another Jean Herschelt Humanitarian Academy Award in 1993 for her work, Knight of the French Legion Honor in 1987, as well as the Presidential Citizens Medal in 2001. Of course, she had her 11 fragrances and jewelry, but I will always remember her as the actor with such a big heart and soul for people, film, and life. So many people forget how great of an actress she was because of how big her persona was and all the antics she would pull within her contracts to show up on set at 10 a.m. And by the time she was ready to film, it was already lunch. And then she wouldn't return from lunch until 4 p.m. sometimes. But when she was on, oh man, she was all on. When you look back on her films today, there will always be the twinkle in our eye as we say, she was absolutely incredible. And snap! That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Tell me, did I miss anything? Do you agree with my picks? What are some of your favorite performances by this iconic legend? Please share in the comments below. I love to hear your thoughts. I welcome them so greatly. If you haven't already, please subscribe, click like, it doesn't hurt anybody, and tell all your friends. Ring that bell to stay updated on more to come, and as always, thank you all so very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it, and yes, please keep the classics alive.